Hey guys, Skate with Stephen back again with uh, with another of our Forces of Hordes book rundowns. With the imminent arrival of Vengeance, the new War Machine book, I'm trying to get at least all the Hordes books out of the way and done. Um, then I'll do Vengeance, and then I'll have to go back and do the uh, and do the War Machine books. But I'm trying to get these all sorted and done in the next few weeks before Vengeance actually hits stores. So we've got minions, got a nice front cover here. Uh, minions, for those who aren't aware, uh, other than generic minions, there are two sort of factions, pacts, uh, within the minions, which are the uh, the gators, which are the blind water congregation. And we've got the uh, the pigs, which are the Thornfall Alliance. Um, so basically, you've only got the two pacts for minions, um, as opposed to the uh, four, although now five, for mercenaries with the Celifax Unveil. Um, if you want to look up the Celifax, search for the Privateer Press Prime YouTube channel. Uh, there's a preview of the Celifax. So we've got the, uh, there's the front cover. Very nice bit of artwork of a, uh, two heavies having a scrap. So then we're into the, uh, into the cover. Which, as always, nice bit of artwork and boss on the page. And there's the artwork with all the, all the runes, credits. You got a bit about playing minions and uh, and this very brief faction in the background. You got a nice bit of fluff about Lord Carver, who is the uh, the leader of the Pharaoh, which are the uh, are the Thornfall Alliance. Um, he's united everyone under his banner uh, with the uh, with the help of Doctor Arcadius, who's the one who's basically given him the uh, access to his beasts. So there we go. That's the fluff. So. Sit 14 pages of fluff um, in the opening of the book, and then you've got the minion armies, and you've got about packs, and you've got about using them in uh, using them in your in your actual mainstream faction armies. So it talks about you either have to take a theme force or you have to take a pact. Theme forces obviously follow the theme force benefits and restrictions, but the generic pacts you can use as long as you you use the certain models. For instance, if we go with the Thornfall Alliance. Your army must be constructed under the Thornfall Alliance Pact, and it can include any minion, Pharaoh models, or units. The model can also include Dr. Arcadius, Alton Ashley, Gudrun the Wanderer, Saxon Oric, and Victor Pendrake. Increase the field allowance of all non-character Pharaoh models and units in the army by plus one, and Pharaoh units in the army gain advanced deployment. So there you go. That's quite nice. Advanced deployment on your units. Um, then you got the Blind Water Congregation. And the army composition is an army constructed under the Blind Water Congregation Pact can include all minion pact models with the amphibious ability. The army can also include Feral Geists, Swamp Gob of Bellows Crew, a Thralg, Totem Hunter, and Victor Pendrake. You may increase the fast the field allowance of all non character Gatorman models and units including the army by one. And its special rules are you may place up to two 3 inch AoEs anywhere completely within 20 inches of the back edge of your deployment zone after terrain has been placed, but before either player deploys his army. The AoEs are shallow water terrain features and they cannot be placed within 3 inches of another terrain feature. They can be useful um, just for providing that uh, blocking of charge lanes, although 20 inches up isn't massively far. Um, however, I have seen them used to reasonable effect. Um, by the local gator player. So then we get into the uh, the actual theme forces themselves. So you've got Dr. Arcadius, Lord Carver, Caliban, Bloody Barnabas. And those are the only four warcasters in this book. Obviously being a minion pack book, it's a somewhat smaller book than some of the uh, some of the standard Hordes faction books. Um, but to be honest, there's a quite a lot of good stuff in here for either taking the faction yourself or for, for expanding an existing faction such as uh, such as my circle of Orbris, circle Orbris even, um, and you know any other faction that you may play. So again, there's a bit just discussing their their various ro roles within each faction in the fluff and how they get along with each of the factions. Like for instance, the Scorn basically just enslave them. Um, Orbris tend to manipulate them. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of manipulation going on. So we start with the um, the generic solos um, that aren't specifically tied to a uh, to a pact. So you've got the Feral Geist, um, who is essentially an incorporeal ghost that can take over the dead war beasts on the table. Uh, he's only one point, uh, th three cost field allowance. I've mostly seen him used to contest zones, to be honest. Um, 
in a, in a steamroller around last year. Um, the Gator player ran, I think, two in both his lists, um, which were mostly used to go contest zones, because if he wasn't playing against um, Signar, it meant that mostly it's difficult for things to kill him because he needs uh, they need magical weapons. Um, so he was using them mostly for that, but they can possess the, the, the body of a deceased war beast and control it very briefly. Um, so there's definitely a nice idea there. Um, they're quite flimsy, but being incorporeal again, it's about having those magical weapons to actually be able to deal with them. Um, the defense 14 armor 11 with uh, with just the one hitbox, but they're only one point. So you know, again, even just running around contesting zones, they're quite nice. So you've got the Throg, which is uh, which is another solo. Uh, he has eight damage boxes. He's a field lance two, and he's three points cost. He has advanced deployment, fearless. Arcane Interference, which is when he hits a model with an attack, upkeep spells, and Anima and the model hit automatically expire and it loses focus points. And if it's a Warjack, it suffers disruption. And when an enemy model casts a spell or uses an Animus while in this model's command range of 7. After the spell is cast, the enemy model suffers 1 damage point, and this model heals 1 damage point, and, it can't, and itself it can't be targeted by spells, it has magical weapons, and it has reach on its 1 tentacle attack. It's alright, it's quite nice. Um, Obviously, it adds disruption into minion armies and into uh, hordes as a whole because he can be taken by Circle, Legion, Scorn, and Trollblood. So he's not affected at all um, by your faction. He'll work with you. Um, I'm not sure if the. I think the problem with the Throg is he's nice and the model is reasonably nice, although it is getting a bit dated. Um, the on the tabletop, the stuff in faction that you might want to spend in those three points on. Um, and as such, I don't think I've ever seen anyone field them other than our local Gator player, and he's only got one, um, which crops up in one of his two steamroller lists. So, again, it's a nice idea, and the artwork, I mean, look at that, that is a lovely bit of artwork. Um, but I don't know, maybe there's, there needs to be... I think maybe you need the support to be able to get that guy in there, and to get there to do his job. Which perhaps is sometimes lacking. Uh, Alton Ashley, um, he'll work for... Circle and Troll Bloods, but he will also work for Signal Cador and the Protectorate. So he's a bit of a uh, he's a bit of a mercen well, he's a mercenary minion character solo. Uh, he's only got five damage. He's a character. He's two point cost. However, he has got a Pow 12 range 14 gun, advanced deployment, Pathfinder, camouflage, Monster Hunter, and Swift Hunter. Now, Monster Hunter is his interesting one because before you roll four damage with his Pow 12 gun, you roll a D6 and assign that damage to the war beast, which is quite nice, it's a guaranteed d6 points of damage on a war beast, um, plus the power 12. Um, he is of course rat 8, because he's a sniper character, which means even against warp wolves he's going to be you know, hitting on 6s, unless of course their, their defence is buffed in any way. Um, but again for 2 points I think he's quite solid. Um, specifically against war machine uh, against hordes. Sorry, I'm not sure if he's particularly good against war machine. Um, I suppose he could be used to take out troublesome solos. Um, problem being that he doesn't have any way of ignoring. He doesn't have true sight or anything like that. Nothing that helps him ignore um, cover or concealment or anything like that. But for two points, he's been quite useful against hordes. Brun, Crag, Back, and Lug. Now these guys um, just just tear face if you can get them in um, they will work for one of the mercenary pacts they will work for the Seer Forge Commission which is the Dwarven Mercenary Pact and they will also work for Circle and Trollbloods now this brings a character warlock with a war beast which is independent of your battle group quite nice um, they both have flank with each other um, he has power and strength 10 on his axe um, he's also can transfer damage to Lug if they're in base-to-base -base contact without spending Fury. Um, Pathfinder, Fearless, quite nice. His one spell is Stonehold, um, which basically means enemy models roll one less die on attack damage rolls against this model. This model and friendly models base-to-base -base with it cannot be knocked down. So basically there's a lot of, uh, lot of synergy with putting him base-to-base -base with Lug. He can only cast that spell on himself and he only has four Fury, so it's half his Fury just to, tr just to cast that. Um, Lug then has uh, has the spell Bear Hands, which is well, sorry, the Animai Bear Hands. There's only one point. Um, and when this model hits an enemy model with a normal melee attack, it can choose to knock down the enemy model or push it directly three inches away. 
quite nice. Um, he has flank with the other guy, which is uh, flank on a power strength 15. It's quite tasty. Um, he's got chain attack, grab and smash. Two open fists. The two of them only cost nine points. Quite nice. Um, especially with the reduced damage, it's actually better to just kill the bear rather than trying to kill the dwarf and make the bear run away because the dwarf just has so much because of the, that, you know, one less die of damage due to that uh, that spell he's got. He's a nightmare to get rid of, and his free transfers. Um, so basically, better off just killing the bear. Um, but nine points, quite nice. Um, and who doesn't love a sort of a Russian-looking dwarf with an armored polar bear? You've got Gudrun the Wanderer, who's a mercenary minion Ogren character solo. He'll work for Crix, Signar, Kador, Circle, Legion, Scorn, and Trollbloods. So almost everyone. Advanced Deployment, Fearless, Pathfinder, Berserk, uh, Binge Drinking, Feign Death, and Hangover. Uh, he costs three points. Um, again, he suffers more from being three points that could be spent elsewhere. He's alright. You know, he can hit things reasonably well, he's a reasonable power and strength 15, um, I think the, again he just suffers more from there being other models out there that are better to take um, in that points bracket, but he's got a lovely bit of artwork and the model's actually pretty much that artwork as well, um, so it's a nice enough looking model um, and it can be taken in quite a lot of things. Um, I think perhaps they just need, he needs to be used well to synergize with something just to, just to make sure that He's um, you know, just to, I think bring him to his full potential because at the moment he's all right on paper, um, but I think he just needs perhaps that something extra just to just to tip him over to, uh, to see regular play. You've got the other uh, one of the other lesser lesser warlocks, which is Dahlia Hale 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 and Scaraf. Um, I think that's probably how you pronounce them. Um, she is again a mercenary minion. They're a nine point one. All of the the character warlock mini warlocks and their their associated beast are nine points. She'll work for the Retribution, Circle, and Trollbloods. I believe. Um, no, she isn't a Retribution partisan. She's not like uh, not like both the irises, which um, when you use or two of the irises. Now there's a third one. Um, she can't be used as a, she doesn't count as a faction model. Um, she's just in the faction. Um, or can be taken. Um, she's a lesser warlock, she, her limited battle group is Scarath. She has two spells Haunting Melody and Mistwalker. Haunting Melody is while, this model's con while in this model's control area, which is 8 inches, uh, living enemy models cannot give or receive orders and cannot make melee or ranged attacks targeting this model. Quite nice. Can mess up if you can get near enough to an enemy model to do that. Um, but she can obviously be shot at. From, from outside that range. She's also got Mistwalker, uh, which, gain, which is target model on this model's battle group, gain Pathfinder and Prowl for a turn. So quite useful on her if you can get her into something that grants her stealth. Um, she's defense 16, armor 12, so she's not a pushover. However, yeah, I mean, that puts defense 18 with stealth if she gets into somewhere that triggers Prowl um, and is using the spell. You know, her armor's a bit low, but again, that order... It's quite nice. Oh, sorry, the uh, haunting melody is quite nice for preventing orders, for so stopping charges, and that sort of thing. Uh, you've got Scarath, who has Serpent Strike. She's target-friendly model, gains Repost. Serpent Strike lasts for one round, um, and basically Serpent Strike expires as soon as you make one of these Repost attacks. It basically means when when you are missed by an enemy melee attack, you immediately make an attack against that model. Quite nice. Uh, he's also got Serpentine, so he cannot make Slam or Trample power attacks. But he can't be knocked down. Quite nice. Um, he's also got a 10 inch POW 12 spray, which, because he's a war beast, is boostable. Um, it, has the, it has the corrosion effects, and it has the. Sorry, it has a continuous effect corrosion. So, just continuous effect corrosion. Quite nice. Um, his melee attack has reach and critical consume. But that spray 10 POW 12, quite nice. I am tempted. I've got the model somewhere. Um, I need to actually get it painted and probably finish assembling it. I think it's only part done. Um, I would be tempted to try it with, uh, basically try a ranged army with my circle, um, take like that and a pure blood wolf, and basically try and get as many as many ranged attacks in in a circle army as possible. Because most people don't expect that from circle, because we tend to run quite infantry melee oriented, sorry beast infant, um, 
beast, melee oriented anti infantry. Um, so we've got Saxon Oric, who's a mercenary minion character as well, who work for Crix Cador and the Protectorate, Circle, Scorn, and Trollbloods. Now, Saxon Oric, I believe, is part of the deposed Signar regime. Um, so he's a bit peeved. Um, so he does not like um, does not like Signarans. He has advanced deployment, fa fearless, pathfinder, stealth. Um, and when an enemy war beast misses its model with a melee attack, immediately after the attack is resolved, this model can make one normal melee attack against the war beast. He has dismember, which means his attacks get a bonus damage die against war beasts um, on melee. So his um, sword becomes power strength 10 with 3 dice, 4 on a charge. Uh, he has got a, a 5 inch range reconnaissance special action, which is target friendly warrior model unit. If the model unit is in range, he gains Pathfinder for one turn. Uh, he has takedown, so he ignores tough. Um, and his skinning knife allows him to place or remove one point of fury from a war beast. So, all in all, he's quite nice. He can dish out Pathfinder on a stick. He is only two points. Um, he can be used possibly to finish off a war beast. I mean, power strength 10 on the charge. Weapon master essentially against a war beast. Probably maybe take down a light. He's only he's Matt and Rat Seven. So you know he can certainly get the job done. He has two attacks as well. Um, and the other attack is only power strength eight. Um, but again against a war beast, three dice of damage. So I imagine it's something that's low armor or a light war beast. He could definitely give it a good go. So then we've got Victor Pendrake, who I believe actually trained Saxon Oric, uh, and then they had a bit of a. Uh, a disagreement on the, on the loyalty to the Signal Crown. Um, he'll work for Circle and Trollbloods, and he has Animosity Saxon Auric. Um Fearless Pathfinder, tough. He has Beast Law, which is a range 3 action. Target friendly warrior model unit. The warrior model unit is in range, against boosted attack rolls against War Beast for a turn. It's quite nice. Uh, he also has Dismember. He has Ducks against plus 4 defense against melee and range attacks made by War Beasts. He has a cumbersome knockdown range 8 gun. Um, he has a range 12 power 10 bow with the uh, reroll to hit. And he also has a magical sword um, at power strength 11. Um, I don't think he'll see, he sees as much uh, as much play as Saxon Auric, perhaps, um, given they're both in the same gun uh, points bracket. Um, although the knockdown gun, I imagine, is quite tasty. Um, it is cumbersome and it's only range 8. However, I imagine that there are circumstance, certain circumstances where a knockdown would be very effective. You've got Lenissa Rassel, who's a Nis sorceress. Uh, she has Animosity Legion or Blighted models. Uh, she will work for Signar Retribution, Circle and Trollbloods. Uh, she has Pathfinder. Uh, she has three magic Ability 7 attacks, which are Hunter's Mark, which basically means you can get extra bonus charges, a generic damage attack, um, which is range 10 power 12, and oh, it makes things stationary on a critical hit, quite nice. Um, she's got Winter Storm, which is any models that begin their activation in this model's command range of 9. Uh, lose Eyeless Sight, Flight, and Pathfinder for their activation. She has Prowl and uh, gains boosted attack and damage rolls against Legion or Blighted models. For a two point model, not too bad. Uh, she has Critical Freeze on her melee weapon. So, yeah, I can see her, you know, between um, Winter Storm as her special action and charging a Legion creature, um, she can, I'd imagine, cause them issues. Um, again, not amazingly. Um, I would like to drop her in a game at some point because um, I've got the model and it's quite a nice model. Um, it's again, it's finding those two points that I can, I can reasonably slot her in um, and get some good use out of her. And you've got the Totem Hunter, who is actually a character, um, and he'll work for any of the four, uh, the four um, factions for hordes: Fearless Pathfinder, Stealth Hunter, Jump, Prey, Sprint. Uh, power strength 14 and 11 respectively on his two weapons um, again re reasonably useful for flanking taking out pesky enemy solos getting into the rear part of the enemy army um, 
I want to give him a go at some point. To be honest, I haven't used him. Got a model again. Um, I haven't got around to really trying it at the moment. Um, mostly because I've stepped away from my circle for a little bit just to uh, mess about a lot with my signal and I'm starting to get drawn into the lure of Mercs at the moment um, but I would definitely like to give the Totem Hunter a, a full play test um, perhaps especially in some smaller point games where I think he'll actually really shine I'm look at that artwork, it's a lovely bit of artwork um, so then we're on to the Gator Men talking about their god Kosk nice bit of um, artwork with Gatormen subduing Bogtrogs, Bogtrogs who are another amphibious race in Amoran. Not bloody Barnabas. An explanation of the Blind Water Congregation, its organisation, and uh, the army under Caliban. You're straight into bloody Barnabas. Um, he will work for any of the, in a two caster game, he'll work for any of the Horde's factions. Um, he has a feat which basically is if you aren't amphibious, you're knocked down as long as you're an enemy model. So, as we know from Krios, a knockdown feat can be quite strong in the right circumstances. Um, he's also got counter charge and, and unyielding, quite a nice combination. Uh, he's got critical consume on a bite attack. Uh, he's got reach and the ability to cast a three cost spell if he kills something with his axe. Quite nice. His spells, very nice selection of spells. Uh, flesh eater, iron flesh. Anyone who's played against Kador in the past ever will understand how annoying that spell is. Um, Swamp Pit and Warpath. Warpath also very good. Uh, Swamp Pit basically makes him un it makes his units untargetable by ranged attacks if he casts a Swamp Pit and then they jump in it. So it's quite good. He's got six fury. Um, all of his spells uh, bar one cost two. So they're quite quite nice. Two of them are upkeeps. Um, and with Blood Boon on his on his axe he can actually smack things and, and get a spell off. As far as fluff goes, this guy wants to uh, wants to ascend to godhood basically. He's going around murdering, killing, um, trying to essentially empower himself to become a god. And as such he has subjugated Caliban to work for him. Caliban does not like him at all, um, but does need to work with him um, or face death essentially. Um, Caliban has Death Harvest as his feat, which is each time a friendly a friendly model destroys an enemy model whilst in, while the friendly model is in Caliban's control area, Caliban gains one fury. Immediately after resolving an attack in which a model in Caliban's control area destroys one or more enemy models, Caliban can cast one spell. Caliban can boost attack and damage rolls and spells cast as a result of Death Harvest. Death Harvest lasts for a round and he will work for any Horde's faction. Um, yeah, so basically he can cast all the spells out of activation and can he circumvents the rule of no boosting outside your own activation on, on his feet turn, it's quite nice he's amphibious um, he's got a range 10 power 10 rate fire 2 gun called heart stopper uh, which when a living enemy model is boxed by its attack it heals one damage point for the rest of the turn the model can be channeled through you can channel spells through it um, uh, yeah, if it's in your control area and not engaged, at the end of the turn the enemy model is destroyed. He's got a sustained attack on uh, on one of his melee weapons, uh, which is his bite, and uh, his melee weapon is uh, a magical weapon reach with a life trader, quite nice. He's got Bone Shaker, Carnivore, Hex Blast, Oculation, which is the one that gains, gives you stealth to a unit, and Parasite. It's quite a nice combination of spells, especially given he can spam them out on his uh, on his turn. Uh, these two of the beasts you'll most likely see when playing against gators. You've got Bull Snapper, which is a light with spiny growth. Um, it's a, That's basically what's there as a transfer target and as a spiny growth spammer um, in most people's lists. It can get the job done um, against certain things, um, but it's a light, so obviously it's, it's not going to be amazing against, say, enemy heavies, um, or even to a certain extent against other lights. Um, so if it eats infantry, um, then it pretty much stops as soon as it's killed one, um, due to its torpid rule. It is, however, three points. Very nice, very cheap. Um, it also charges for free against living enemy, enemy warrior models. Uh, you've got the Black Eyed Rassler, the Animus Rise, uh, which basically spend one, range six, knockdown model immediately stands up. Very nice. Amphibious, Maneater, so it charges living warrior models without being forced. Um, when not down, this model can make attacks, has a melee range, can engage other models, and can be engaged, and can use its animus. 
It also has snacking. It has a special attack death roll, which is on a hit before rolling damage. You can decide to knock down both this model and the model hit. If both models are not down, the damage roll is boosted. Very nice. Uh, it's got two open hands. Um, power and strength, 17, 14, 14 respectively. Um, defense 12, armor 19. Four points of fury. Nine point cost. It's quite alright. Quite decent, which is why you see it quite often. The Ironback Spitter, which to be honest I have never seen anyone play. Um, which is a shame, because the model is really nice. Um, it's got some shooting. Uh, it's range 12, AoE 3, power 14. So it's alright. Um, continuous effect corrosion, yeah. Uh, two open fists. A third melee attack in its bite. Um, yeah, it's got some nice stuff. It's got the ornery uh, animus. Um, so that's that's the war beast section for the gators. You're into the bog trog ambushes. Unit with ambush, quite nice. Uh, will work for any model, any um, hordes faction. Pathfinder, combined melee attack, camouflage, reach, powerful charge. Uh, there are five eight units, so quite cheap. The gator man posse, which is basically what it's all about with the gator men. Um, you've will work for any of the four hordes factions. It's only three or five models, six and nine points respectively. Um, they are amphibious, fearless, they have reach, unyielding, and they have one of three abilities every turn, uh, which is Cold Blood, which is effective models can reroll Mr. Tat rolls against living models this turn. Uh, Dirge and Mist, plus one defense and terror for a round, or March, gain Pathfinder for one round, and they get plus two inches of movement when they charge a living model. Quite nice. Uh, you've got the Swamp Gobbers Bellow Crew, which is one point, which is basically a roving 5 inch AoE cloud effect, and they'll work for any Hordes faction. If if the uh, m Grunt model dies, it becomes a 3 inch AoE. Right, so we've got the Croak Hunter, which is a solo uh, with stealth, poison, basically one of your flanking solos, basically, that goes after uh, after enemy sort of solos or war beasts that are skirting around the flank. Um, for two points, it's pretty decent. Um, you tend to see quite a lot of them appear in uh, in armies with gators, like two or three in some lists. Uh, then you've got the gator character war beast, wrong guy and snapjaw. Uh, wrong guy has influence and voodoo doll spells. He will work for cricks and all the hordes factions. Um, he's got life drinker on his melee attack and reach on his um, on his weapon attack. Um, you've then got snapjaw with submerge as an animus. Basically says this model cannot be targeted by ranged or magical attacks and does not block line of sight. So quite tasty because that can be cast on both him and Snapjaw. Uh, wrong guy even because he's Snapjaw. Um, he's got Bloodthirst um, and Maneater. And when he boxes the living enemy model with a melee attack, the model is removed from play and either Snapjaw or Wrong heal D3 damage points. Quite nice. And his tail attack has critical knockdown. So on to the Pharaoh. Quick talk about the Pharaoh and sort of how they work. Um, explaining sort of the territorial and how they became the Thornfall Alliance. Lord Carver's sort of layout of his warrior models. Um, you then got Dr. Arcadius, who's the ba basically the guy who em empowered all the Pharaoh beasts and combined them with this, uh, this strange pseudoscience. Um, that he's got going on. There was a brilliant article in one of the more recent No Quarters um, discussing Dr. Arcadius and basically what his contemporaries think of him. It's brilliant. Um, as far as spells go, he's got Aggravator, Crippling Grasp, Forced Evolution, Primal Shock and Psychosurgery. Um, his feet basically allows all of his war beasts to frenzy, um, which obviously requires a lot of careful placement. Um, as such, he's a little more complicated to use um, in the Pharaoh army than some other models. Um, he's also got Maltreatment, Fury 7, um, his Combat Syringe, which is a melee weapon, has no damage, um, but it does have three types of uh, weapon attack, which are, you can make a model stationary, you can damage them, and they cannot cast spells, upkeep spells, using Animus for one round, um, or you can use Mind Control Serum, sorry, I should say this, this, this weapon does one point of damage automatically, or if it's a living enemy non-caster non-warlock model, um, you can take control of the model, make a full advance and attack. You can't be targeted by free strikes. So quite nice. Uh, then you've got Lord Carver himself. Nice bit of artwork for him on his throne. Um, 
He's got Batten Down the Hatches, Mobility, Quagmire and Rift as spells. He has Elite Cadre Pharaoh Brigands, which gives them combined range attack. He has Inspiration to Pharaoh in his 9-inch control area. He is tough. He'll work for any of the, uh, the factions. He has a double barrel sawn off shotgun, <coughs> which can get a two barrel attack. Uh, he's got a magical weapon and reach on his parachute 15 sword. Uh, also, his feat is Hog Heaven. While in Carver's control area, friendly Pharaoh models gain overtake and an additional die on melee attack and damage rolls. Oh, sorry, on melee damage rolls, not on attack rolls, thankfully. Um, and then they get the, the movement from the overtake. So we've got the gun bore. Um, now, some of the... Uh, some of the war beasts of Faro have got the Bacon Rule, which is when this model is destroyed, each living war beast base to base with it heals D3 damage. Which I love because it's just a funny um, just a funny rule, basically. I've uh, got the Counter Blast Animus, he's got a range 10 AoE 3 pound 13 gun. Um, it's only five points, he's got two open fists. He's a lot of war beast, you know. You can't be expecting him to do a lot of heavy lifting, but at the same time be quite useful in a pinch. Uh, then you've got the Warhog. Uh, it's got Massacre as an Animus, it's got Aggression Dial, which basically means it can uh, it can be forced during its activation to gain plus through 2 strength and suffer D3 damage points, and it has critical knockdown on one of its 3 initial melee attacks. But plus 2 strength would give it power strength 18, 18, 17, which is pretty lethal against most things, and it only costs 8 points as well. Uh, so then you're into the units, you've got the Pharaoh Bone Grinders, uh, which can be taken by any Hordes factions. Um, this model gains a cumulative plus one on magic attack rolls for each other mem each other model in this unit that's within one inch of it. Um, so basically, that's that's telling you to close up your unit of bone grinders, which can be quite nasty against blast damage. But their defense twelve, armor fourteen. So let's see how that goes. Um, and then they've got two different special attacks. Um, or sorry, special actions. One of which can be an attack. Um, they can basically spend. Um, they can cast an animus, basically, um, or they can craft a talisman, um, which increases the range of spells for a controlling warlock. Uh, you then got Pharaoh Brigands, um, which have dig in, and also have a bunch of prayers. Um, they've got a range ten power twelve gun, and obviously with long card they gain combined range attack, so quite nice. Uh, they can either be fearless and tough for a round, or they can. Make one range attack this activation before the unit makes its normal movement. After their normal movement, models in this unit that make combat actions can only make melee attacks, so they can shoot and then move, which is quite nice. Um, you've got the Pharaoh Razorback crew, which is basically a rocket launcher, uh, power 14, uh, sorry, range 14, power 15, AoE 3. They've got dig in, light artillery, um, plus 2 to attack rolls, they become Rat 6. Um, you've then got Rorsch and Brine, who are the character uh, 9 point. Lesser Warlock, um, got Pig Pen, which is well within three inches of this model. Enemy models treat open terrain as rough terrain. That's the spell on uh, Rorsch. Um, he'll work for Signal, Kador, Protector, Crick, Circle, Legion, Scorn, Trollblood, so pretty much everyone. Um, he's got Dig In, he's got Diversionary Tactic, which basically means he can drop a four inch AoE of explosion on himself um, and then move. Uh, he's also got the ability. To make a full advance directly towards Brine before leeching Fury in a turn. It's quite nice. And then you've got Brine, who's got Pig Farm as an Animus. Um, this model gains an additional die melee damage rolls against living models. When this living when this model boxes a living model with its melee attack, this model can heal D3 damage points. If this model heals, the box model is removed from play. So it kind of gains snacking. He has the bacon rule. He uh, has Pain Response, which means if you damage him, he can make charge or power attacks without being forced. He is also pig-headed, and if this model is destroyed by an enemy attack, or if Rorsch is destroyed or removed from play by an enemy attack, before this model is removed from the table, it can advance up to 3 inches and make 1 melee attack, um, ignoring the effects of loss aspects and ignoring free strikes. So quite nice. Um, you get one last attacker. Mat 6, power and strength 15. Um, when... Basically, during its activation as well, it can charge and make a slam power attack against an enemy model that was damaged by a melee or ranged attack made by Rorsch this turn, without being forced. 
be quite nice, especially given Rorsch actually has a, uh, a range 10 power 12 pistol, um, which you can use. Uh, he's also got a critical knockdown, one of his melee attacks. And then we're basically that's it, and we're into the painting section already on the book. Um, again, like I said, it's quite a short book. I mean, you're looking at probably less than 100 pages by the time you get past the uh, the painting section. Um, basically talking about you know painting feral geists and the tassel worm, uh, gatorman posse and pharaoh flesh. Then we're into the gallery, and you've got the uh, the casters. You've got some generic solos and units, um, and then you're into the pharaoh models. Uh, then the Gateman specific models. There you go, that's page 95. So that's page 96, we're back into the generic ones. And that's it. That's the end of the book. So, hopefully we'll get to see some more exciting stuff for, uh, for Minions soon. Uh, with the announce of, announcement of Exigence uh, towards the autumn of this year. Uh, again, look at Privateer Press's, uh, Press's channel if you want to, uh, on YouTube, if you want to see the video about Exigence previews. Um, there are a few other things for minions in the other two, in the other two books I haven't yet looked at, um, but the big big surprise is Exigent Battle Engines for minions, which would be quite tasty. Both the concept arts look really nice for them. Um, well, the Gator one looks really nice. The Pharaoh one looks typically Pharaoh uh, in appearance. Um, but yeah, so hopefully minions are on the up and up. Um, they did have a Prime uh, Privateer Press do a podcast as well the other day, which basically semi announced a Faro solo coming in exigence uh, a new one um, well they didn't say what he did or what he was capable of um, but they said depending on the results of the recent of the league that is in March you may find out more information about him so hopefully that was a that was a nice rundown of the of the minions rule book for you um, I hope to be back with domination and gargantuans and then vengeance um, as soon as I can get a hold of that book and uh, do a run through of how all the, uh, the factions are represented in those three books. So, this is Scapegoat Stephen, and I'll see you next time.